And that really made me realise how big an effort it was, not just for the players on that day and the coaching staff, but the football club as a whole. For the people who have waited 72 years to see South Melbourne slash Sydney Swans win the Premiership, here it is! And the systems are really, really important, and I think a lot of cup corporations and certainly some footy clubs just flounder because they, they don't put the system in place. The best systems are really clear on what their behaviours are going to be. The best systems then you know, reward and challenge based on those behaviours. You know, I talk about behavioural-based footy clubs or talent-based footy clubs. It's the same in corporation. You know, sustained success is built around behaviours, is built around what our actions are. Uh, yeah, talent-based teams just rely on the best product, the best talent, um, best economy. Yeah, when things are going well, they're flying. When things aren't going well, yeah, they're struggling because it's all about the individual. It's not about the team, um, and that's one of the biggest tests. You know, under pressure, do you do what's best for yourself, or do you do what's best for the, your team? That's what sustained success is built on. It's a process, and it's monotonous, and it's boring but it, rel it leads to sustained success. And I talk about it all the time, taking the chance out of culture, you know, and, and then, then acting your way into a system and acting your way out of a system. But if you're not really sure what that system is, then you're leaving your culture to chance. If you get a really strong system like the Sydney Swan system, the Hawthorne system, you know, the Geelong system, you know, it, it is sustained success and it, and it endures over a long period of time. But... To be perfectly frank, if you want to be a high-performing team, a high-performing individual, a high-performing state, country, you know, corporation, whatever it is, you know, you have to have an enormous level of personal accountability and, and team accountability. Welcome to the Get Invested podcast, where we share great conversations with experts from all walks of life to uncover their secret know-how and where they invest their time, their skills, and their money, and the benefits that this has created. You see... The truth is that everyone invests. Every minute of every day, we're investing our time, our skills, our energy, and our money in something. Some of us are investing consciously, some unconsciously, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, and sometimes for no impact. Get Invested will help you to start living by design, not by default. I'm going to help you to make it happen, not let it happen. You will hear the top tips on how you can live with conscious intent so that you can live more, work less and leave a living legacy by investing now. Listen to the show to discover the top tips on how to get started, make the most of your investment journey and ultimately to be living your dream, not someone else's. More episodes can be found on iTunes or at bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. Thanks for listening and now let's get invested. Hi Freedom Fighters. The beginning of the year 2005 was going to be a big emotional and fateful year for my family. We just didn't know it at the time. My good father, the original Bushy, was suffering from failing health after surviving cancer and a series of strokes that was punishing him physically and emotionally. He was paralysed down the right side of his body and he slurred when he talked but he always managed to approach every day with a beaming smile. His bravado and courage in the face of adversity was nothing short of inspirational. And one of the major things that kept him going was his undying faith and belief that his lifetime football club, South Melbourne come Sydney Swans, or the Bloods as they were known, would finally win a grand final after 72 years in the wilderness. The longest premiership drought in the history of the game. Dab was a born and bred Swan supporter and Australian rules football was like a second religion in the family. Our great-grandfather, Ron Burrows, played for the South Melbourne Bloods in the 1920s and he was actually vice president of the club when they'd last won a grand final way back in 1933. So Dad had been waiting since he was a baby in nappies to see his red and whites win another premiership. And despite widespread conjecture to the contrary 
by just about everyone in the media. He was absolutely convinced that 2005 was going to be the Swans' year to bring home that long-awaited flag. In the years 1992 to 1994, the Swans had been bottom of the ladder three years in a row. And in 2002, everyone in the media had again tipped them to be bottom-ranked wooden spooners after losing a lot of their star players. And they managed to finish the season 11th out of 16. But under a new coach, they climbed rapidly to 4th in 2003 and 6th in 2004. And Dad was absolutely convinced that 2005 was going to be their year to bring home that Premiership Cup. The blood started the season with a loss. And this was about the same time as Dad suffered yet another stroke and was hospitalised. His condition deteriorated rapidly due to some terrible nursing neglect. And he ended up dehydrated and suffering from hallucinations. And he contracted pneumonia before we got him moved to intensive care in another hospital. And through all of this, he still managed to watch his mighty swans play. Over Easter that year, sitting around his hospital bed, Dad and my two brothers watched Sydney defeat Geelong. As he lay back in bed with tubes coming out of him in all directions, he pumped his one good arm and he proudly declared that this was going to be Swan's long-awaited premiership year. It was to be the last game he got to see and his dying declaration. A couple of days later, he slipped into unconsciousness and was given just 24 hours to live. Yet despite the odds, he somehow managed to survive for the rest of that week and we spent his final hours around his hospital bed watching Friday night footy before he finally passed in the early hours of Saturday morning, the 16th of April. He'd hung on till Mum and Dad's 45th wedding anniversary. Now, as you'd appreciate, watching the Swans play for the rest of that season, and even now, was a very emotional connection for us, as each game was a reminder of Dad and his determined dying prophecy. Now, at the end of the minor round that year, the Sydney Swans had climbed to third place on the ladder. Their finals campaign then began. After leading by 14 points at the end of the third quarter, the Swans narrowly lost the first qualifying final by four points in a highly controversial game. But they'd earned one more chance to play in the do-or-die elimination semi-final the following week. Our whole family was on tender hooks, as Dad's dream was narrowly kept alive. The following week, the Swans played the Geelong Cats. The Sydney Bloods started very flat, managing only two go- goals to half time, and were trailing by 17 points at the end of the third term. It was going to take an absolute miracle for Sydney to win the game from this position. And this was worsened early in the final quarter when the Cats extended their lead. The Swans Premiership dream and Dad's lifetime ambition looked dead as the final siren loomed. They looked out for the count. And then, out of nowhere, this happened. You have to pick up four or five goals. The way they're playing, they're not going to do it this way. You've got to do something Davis radical. a chance from the pocket. Davis kicks up beauty! I didn't do that. <laughs> Nick Davis, the magic from deep in the fourth pocket. The margin back to 16 points. Now they can go. They release O'Keefe and Williams. Look at them link up through the middle. The Swans are off in relay. Long from O'Keefe. Long and strong. Nick Davis is the hope. He's the hope. Will he be the hero? He's kicked 19-8 from set shots this year. their half of the ground. In fact, every player, Steve, is in the defensive 50. Every Geelong player. Unbelievable. Chance for Kennelly. 
Davis. Davis has kicked two. He snaps from 40. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. He's kicked a goal. Unbelievable stuff from Nick Davis. Can you believe this? He's kicked three final quarter goals. And the Swans are within three points. He's had a sensational game. The bend off there and the kick. That is a tough kick to nail that under pressure. The Swans within three points. The clearance is important. A contest with a big prize. A place in the preliminary final. Who wants it the most? Ablett keeps it in. The Cats want to take it over. They're not daring to go after the footy. The Swans are. O'Keefe. They need a hero. Crouch couldn't take it. Oh, how's that? Ablett. This is unbelievable stuff. Will someone stand up? O'Keefe stood, but just as soon as he stood, he was constrained, he was handcuffed, he was shoved to the ground. Oh, how good was that? Somehow, Nick Davis kicked four goals in the final quarter to win the game and the last goal in the dying seconds to put them in front. It was a freaky kick on his non-preferred left foot that came out of nowhere. We were absolutely overjoyed with the motion as we leapt around the living room. It was one of the most incredible wins in finals history. The Swans, in snatching an unlikely victory, had hit the front just seconds before the end of the game for the first time since the six-minute mark at the start of the game. I still tear up every time I hear that footage because we were all convinced that Dad's spirit had inspired that win. As you now hear from my good brother, Ian Bushy Martin's appearance on Eddie Maguire's footy show the week after. Boys, believe it or not, Sydney have not won a final on the MCG in as either South Melbourne or Sydney well, since 1936. Sheesh. And I don't think it's going to change, Ed. I think uh, it's going to be a very, very close game. Um, really looking forward to, uh, to watching uh, Barry Hall in particular. I don't think St Kilda have got a great match-up, but uh, you've got to pick the Saints, I think, Fed. Yeah, I'm with, uh, I'm with Luke. I think uh, Barry Hall will have a good game, but I don't think it'll be enough. I think St Kilda are a far, far better team. I think Saints were uh, really good things until the weekend when they didn't play, surprisingly, and now they've come back with these big injury clouds. I reckon uh, Harvey and Hayes and Ball and Del Sano might just get them across the line. Just. Weatherman? Oh, I reckon the Swannies will get this one. We understand you've got some relationship to uh, the Swans presidents. Uh, my great grandfather was the president in 1933 when they last. When you won? Yes. Your great grandfather was the president of the Swans uh, or South Melbourne. Richard Burrows. Fantastic, right? Eh? Good Royalty. on you. Yes, sir. Good on you. <laughs> <laughs> 
You can see how the lineage just dropped off since 1933. Certainly, show a bit of passion. If exactly. Your great yeah, was fired up about it. Did you, uh, did you, just speaking of that, did you, uh, do you feel this is starting to come together for the Swans now after the South Melbourne dramas and all the rest of it? Absolutely. And um, my, my father actually passed away, uh, passed away five months ago, and he supported the Swans for 70 years. So this is a year. In fact, I think he kicked a goal in the last game. It wasn't Nick Davis, it was my father kicking the goal. <laughs>《Awesome Work Bro》I love watching that Now the following week The Swans went into the Premier League final As underdogs to St Kilda As you just heard And they were behind by 7 points At the final break The season was again on the line And the Premiership dream was fading But another final quarter onslaught Saw the Swans boot 7 goals To come out victors by 31 points Yet another miraculous win. Dad's mighty swans had repeatedly overcome the odds and defied the critics to earn their place in the grand final against the West Coast Eagles and the chance to break the 72-year-long premiership voodoo. The grand final started at a feverish pace with the Eagles drawing first blood to kick the opening goal just two minutes into the game. It was a tight and dow contest right from the get-go, with the Swans narrowly holding on to a two-point lead at the first break. We were biting our nails. A stronger second quarter saw the Swans extend their lead to 20 points by half-time. We hardly dared to dream of victory. However, the Eagles fought back bravely in the third quarter, and the Bloods were lucky to hold just a two-point lead going into the final quarter. We were on the edge of our seats, but it wasn't over yet. After leading for most of the match, the Swans found themselves behind three minutes into the final quarter, and four minutes later, the Eagles kicked another goal. And Dad Swans, after looking comfortable at half-time, trailed by eight points, and the Premiership dream was fading rapidly. Over halfway through the final quarter, the Eagles were leading by five points when the Swans managed to snap a goal to put the Swans one point in front with about 12 minutes left to play. No one knew it at the time, but it was the last goal of the match as the Swans held off wave after wave of relentless and tenacious Eagles attacks. With just 10 seconds left to play, the Eagles mounted one last challenge as they pumped the ball forward. A huge pack formed in the Eagles' forward pocket, about 25 metres from goal, and just when the Eagles' Mark Seabee appeared likely to take a big pack mark and kick a goal to snatch victory, there was a red and white blur across the front of the pack as Leo Barry flew to take a spectacular and courageous mark. It was the mark that won the Swans the Premiership. And as he was going back for his kick, the final siren blared. The Swans had limped home by four points against all of the odds for their first Premiership win since 1933. The sound of the siren opened a floodgate of emotion. As a family, we broke down and wept openly and unashamedly, both for the Swans' win, but also for the fulfilment of Dad's lifelong dream. We were beside ourselves with conflicting feelings of joy and grief. A bittersweet victory with mixed feelings of pride for the amazing win and sorrow that Dad wasn't here to enjoy it with us. And victorious coach Paul Ruse summed up the miraculous win beautifully with these immortal words. For the people who have waited 72 years to see South Melbourne slash Sydney Swans win the Premiership, here it is! Here it is! I'll never forget that year. And every time I watch the Swans play, I'm reminded of Dad, the original Bushy. But the question still remains... 
How did the Sydney Swans manage to achieve this? How did the Bloods manage to exceed media, media predictions of being bottom of the ladder in 2002 to become grand final premiers in just three short years? The answer lies with their newly appointed coach at the time and today's very special guest, Paul Ruse. I can't tell you how excited I am to have him on the show as it's a, another massive tick on my bucket list. And as I've mentioned before, there are very few people that I truly respect and admire. In fact, I could count them on an amputated hand. But Rosie is definitely one of them. Before Paul was anointed as the Swans coach for his first full season in 2002, he was a decorated player and captain with a very impressive record of peak performance over a very long period of time. He played 356 AFL games over 17 seasons, kicking 289 goals. And he collected an impressive array of accolades along the way that included five Best and Ferris Club awards, the league's most valuable player award. He represented Victoria on 14 occasions in State of Origin. He achieved seven All-Australian selections. He won the 1986 Lee Matthews Medal and was actually runner-up in the coveted Brownlow Medal the same year, which is the league's best player for the season. He's also the AFL-VFL record holder for the number of games played wearing the number one jumper, which he wore throughout his career with both the Fitzroy Lions and the Sydney Swans. Paul has enjoyed a stellar ride as a high-performing player and captain, but he was still well and truly a rookie coach when he won the senior coach mantle with the Swans in 2002. So as a relative newcomer to leadership in the intensely pressured AFL environment, where you live your life under a microscope for everyone to see from the 24-7 media exposure, how did he manage to take a long-suffering club to the pinnacle of success in just three seasons? What did he think and do that separated him from everyone else at the time? How did he do it? Well, it's no surprise to me that Paul was a man with a plan. The Swan's success was no accident. It was the epitome of peak performance by design. And his pioneering insights and innovations that were very quickly transformed the destiny of the Swans, as well as the Melbourne Demons and now the North Melbourne Kangaroos that Paul has and continues to work with, and has set the benchmark for successful leadership in elite sport ever since, has been built on three key experiences. Firstly, his last 10 weeks as a player spending time on the bench, we had the opportunity to sit beside the coach and observe what it was like for players at all levels, which focused his attention on the need to never forget the player's perspective and what they're going through when you become a coach or a leader. And this resulted in Paul's famous 25 points. Secondly, his time observing and meeting with elite sports across a number of codes in the USA when he took a year sabbatical after he retired from playing helped him to gain many insights that could be applied to AFL and the corporate world. And lastly, the time he spent being forced to document his coaching and leadership manifesto that he presented to the Sydney Swans board in order to win the senior coaching role. This combination of reflective observation, taking in outside influences and documenting his vision and plan have been the cornerstones of his coaching and leadership success and need to be the keys to your approach if you're looking to achieve any form of high performance. So let's drill into this because it's all been documented in his awesome book, Here It Is, which reads like a blueprint for success in any endeavour, not just sport. The individual and team principles and processes that are outlined in Ruzi's book read like a management manifesto without the fluff and the jargon. 
And I'm confident that if you apply his approach to any area of your life, you'll be on the road to peak performance and sustainable success. And it's uncanny how much his principles and approaches captured in Here It Is mirror what my awesome wife Sonia and I have done in our personal and business endeavours. So as I outline some of the key insights from Paul's book Here It Is, apply them to your own situation as an individual, employee, team member, team leader, business owner or board member. They're all universally applicable. They are the essence of Paul's performance by design, which aligns with our own philosophy of living by design, not by default. To live with intent, to make it happen, not let it happen. And his life philosophy also echoes our belief that sustainable success is a long-term journey of staying the course and holding your nerve that lies at the intersection of self, health and wealth. Where self is your mental well-being, including your mindset, outlook, attitudes, beliefs and expectations. Health is about your physical well-being in terms of sleep, breathing, diet, meditation, exercise and the happy habits, rewarding rituals and daily disciplines that you apply that create the discipline, patience and persistence to achieve long-term results. And together, yourself and your health allow you to achieve your definition of success in your wealth, be it work, career, business and where you invest, be it property, shares, business, etc. It's about attending to your personal, professional and passive income lives in parallel in a balanced way that attains and maintains your ideal lifestyle. And Rosie's life is a living testimony to this consistent approach. So let's break down the key philosophies captured in Rosie's Here It Is book. And let's start with his now famous 25 points that he crafted when he was sitting on the bench at the end of his playing career that were and continue to be the cornerstone of his, of his success with the Swans, Melbourne and now North Melbourne. And as I go through these, feel free to substitute the words leader for coach, team member for player, etc. As the points are equally applicable to sport as they are to our personal and our working lives. So here's Rusey's 25 points. One, always remember to enjoy what you're doing. Two, the coach's attitude will rub off on the players. Three, if the coach doesn't appear happy and relaxed, the players will adopt the same mentality. Four, never lose sight of the fact that it's just a game of football. Five, the coach's job is to set strategies. Team plans, team rules, team disciplines, specific instructions to players. Six, good communication skills. Seven, treat people as you want to be treated yourself. Eight, positive reinforcement to players. Nine, players don't mean to make mistakes. They don't go out to lose. Ten, there are 42 senior players, all with different personalities, so deal with each one individually to get the best out of them. Eleven, never drag a player for making a mistake. Twelve, don't overuse interchange. Thirteen, players go into a game with a different mental approach. Fourteen, enjoy training. Fifteen, make players accountable for training, discipline, team plans, because it's their team too. Sixteen, weekly meetings with team leaders. Seventeen, be specific at quarter, half, three-quarter time by readdressing strategies. Don't just verbally abuse. Eighteen, motivate players by being positive. Nineteen, after the game, don't fly off the handle. If you're too emotional, say na- nothing and wait until Monday. Twenty, Surround yourself with coaches and personnel that you know and respect. 21. Be prepared to listen to advice from advisors. 22. Keep training interesting interesting and vary when necessary. 23. Team bonding and camaraderie 
is important for a winning team. 24. Make injured players feel as much a part of the team as possible. Players don't usually make up injuries. And 25. Training should be game-related. For example, the San Francisco 49ers, the backs versus the forwards, and training against the clock. These 25 points are universal and they're timeless. They're not rocket science and they don't need to be. But what separates the best from the rest is that they not only adopt the principles, but they continuously and relentlessly apply them until the thoughts become actions, which become habits, which become behaviours, which become the culture and the system of operation. Until it becomes intuitive and success becomes the inevitable outcome and byproduct. These 25 points were further fused when Rusey was forced to present to the Sydney Swans board to win the coaching job over some pretty hot competition. And to do this, he sat down and documented his coaching vision and his management manifesto. He knew the Swans needed significant change, and he had so many thoughts running around his head. Setting it out in a presentation, clarified his opinions about pre-season training, about developing players, about recruiting. His ideas were translated into a logical, clear action plan. He gave him a guide for the road ahead, and it only took him about 15 hours to crystallise and put together the presentation covering his coaching philosophy, training philosophy, game plan, recruiting and business plan. It talked about areas where they needed to improve. It looked at the individual players and the way they wanted to play. He set out where they were at the end of 2002, where they wanted to get to, and how they could get there. This is a great blueprint for a personal or a business plan. So when was the last time you spent 15 hours getting clear on your vision, what you're trying to achieve, where you are now, and how you're going to bridge the gap? So to get you motivated, here are the highlights from Rusey's presentation. Let's start with his vision. His vision was to inspire, teach and lead the Sydney Swans to become winners. His general philosophy centred around being united. Everyone needed to be on board, all were involved, all had an important role and all needed to be heading in the same direction. Everyone needed a common purpose and synergy between the chairman, the CEO, the football manager, the coach and the player group. Everyone needed to stick to their own job, execute it and be as one in achieving the bigger vision. He focused on excellence, which translated to leading by example, taking no shortcuts, attention to detail and a do or die desire for success. It meant leaving no stone unturned to create an environment where excellence was the minimum standard. The coach had to set the scene to show the team what a professional athlete looked like and how they needed to behave. It meant developing a strong club culture, a sense of belonging, a sense of history, pride in working for the Swans and instilling a positive environment. If Rusey could establish great values, customs and habits at the club, a culture that all, all the players bought into would forge a stronger club. He wanted the players to connect with their history and reach greater heights, playing for something bigger than themselves, and was always based on what was better for the team, not the individual. To be a privilege to wear the red and white jumper. His vision was to develop more leaders among the playing group by getting the players more involved in shaping the club and keeping themselves accountable. He wanted to encourage players to have more ownership over discipline, game planning, meetings and training. The players were to be treated as shareholders of the club, not just employees. He wanted the players to get invested in the club. He focused on the critical need for respect, loyalty and brutal honesty at all times, especially when under pressure. He was saying that just because they're a team doesn't mean that they lie to each other. They don't talk behind people's backs and don't back away from having the hard face-to-face conversations. It was not about winning and losing. 
It was more about the kinds of values and behaviours that they wanted as an organisation and deciding what they stood for. He analysed and defined the key performance indicators, or KPIs, that had the biggest impact on their success. Clean ball gathering of the ground balls and effective tackling were the two closely guarded stats that would guide their success for years, given their massive impact on winning games. He employed benchmarking to rank the team against the best in the competition so they could identify where they needed to improve. And his concluding goal was clear, to inspire, teach and lead the Sydney Swans to be winners and ultimately deliver a premiership. Now, he presented all of this in September 2002, and just three years later, the Swans won their first grand final in 75, in 72 years, should I say. (laughs) Now, it was about formulating and getting everyone to commit to and sticking to a specific agreed plan and then concentrating on processes rather than outcomes to stick to an agreed system. It reinforces the importance of taking the time to really visualise something and saying it out loud to make it happen. Now, many of these aspects are now commonplace in elite sporting clubs and some corporations, but at the time, they were groundbreaking. And once Ruzi's manifesto was endorsed and he was engaged as senior coach, his 25-point coaching notes and his 40-page plan and management manifesto then needed to be embedded into the club by empowering the players and getting their engagement and how the team and the club was to run. He constantly reminded himself to focus on strong, honest relationships built on trust. He created a circle of safety where real talk was fostered. What our know-how business calls brutal honesty keep-stop-start sessions, where everyone openly discusses what each and every team leader, team member needs to keep doing, stop doing and start doing. Empowering the team was about getting the team to establish and then drive their own standards and their own discipline code. The Swans players came up with their three trademark words on how they wanted to be perceived. Hard, disciplined and relentless. And all this was encompassed by calling themselves the Bloods the nickname that used to be associated with the old South Melbourne club. In similar fashion, our know-how pride are driven by our credo that no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And our level of care is driven by our 4F100 formula that measures our success in the eyes of our clients and what's important to them. Everything we do in caring for others must be fast, frequent, friendly and fun and be underpinned by our personal 100% accountability and zero excuses. The Swans team then developed their own team rules and behaviours that everyone agreed to adhere to, that would effectively become their way of life and culture. How would a blood behave both on and off the field? They came up with their non-negotiable behaviours, which included that they would always put the team first, that they'd be honest with each other, they wouldn't back away from any contest, they would always give 100% effort, and they wouldn't wait for others to act. They'd be united and accountable to each other. If one person did the wrong thing, then they pledged that the whole group would have to pay. So what about you? What are your behaviours and your non-negotiables? Well, as an example, for our know-how business, Our agreed team behaviours include making a daily choice to be happy, being fast, friendly and responsive in everything we do. We improve every day and always question how we can do things better. We under-promise and over-deliver by saying exactly what we're going to do, by when, for who, and then we over-deliver. We only work with those that share our values. So... We don't work with jerks, even if it could be financially beneficial. We only do those things that improve the experience, relationships, or the profitability of the business. We don't have meetings for the sake of meetings. And we leave everyone smarter and smiling. And our know-how non-negotiables include 
total personal responsibility, which means 100% accountability and zero excuses. We own our mistakes and we fix them. We always communicate who, what, when and where, and if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. There's no egos allowed and we adopt a no-wanker policy. We demonstrate total direct honesty. If we're not prepared to say something to someone's face, we don't say it. And rewards are team and results based, not individual. And our weekly team meetings and one-on-ones are mandatory. Now, once you've set this behavioural framework, it's then easy for the team to decide on who the supporting leaders should be based on who exhibits these behaviours the best. And once your behaviours have been agreed, it's then important to continuously talk about them and create a system to reinforce them so that each individual knows their role and plays their role in the context of the shared vision and goals. Now this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the goal that Rusey shares in his book, Here It Is. So if you and your team or club or business or corporation don't have a philosophy, a program and processes aimed at achieving peak performance by design, then do yourself a favour and grab a copy of his book because it's an easy and awesome read. And we expand on these principles and many more in our great conversation today where we cover peak performance, sustainable success, leadership, mindfulness and mental health as we dig into Rusey's definition of sustainable success, the criticality of developing systems, the leadership scapegoating epidemic, the need for role modelling, the absence of and the importance of accountability, the importance of personal health to your success in all aspects of your life, the impact of meditation on performance and much, much more. Now, don't be too distracted by the bird squawking in the background. Perhaps it's a swan or the spirit of my dad chirping in to reinforce Rusey's arguments. And if you or your organisation is looking to improve your peak performance by design, then reach out to Paul and his team at Performance by Design at www.performancebydesign.co. Or if you're looking to strengthen the self and health aspects of your success, and incorporate well-being into your behaviours, then reach out to Paul and his wife Tammy's Nurture Group at www.nurturechange.com, which also encompasses nurture360.com.au and nurtureher.com. And if your peak performance and living by design includes investing in property to grow your wealth and replace your income so you can live more and work less, Whether you're just starting out or an existing investor looking to better optimise your portfolio, then come and join me for our live interactive Know How Freedom Flight information sessions, where I'll personally guide you through my proven process for property investment success. To book your ticket or to find out more, just jump on knowhowproperty.com.au forward slash freedom fighters, or just click the link in the show notes. Or if you're a reader, Looking for a GPS roadmap on how to achieve long-term sustainable success? Also grab yourself a copy of my award-winning book, The Freedom Formula, on bushymartin.com.au forward slash books, where you can also grab a free copy of the prequel, Get Invested. And if you're as excited as I am to enjoy Paul Ruse's words of wisdom, then this is the moment that you've been waiting for, because here it is! Welcome Freedom Fighters. Now as you may know, I'm a big believer that sustainable success lies at the intersection of the three elves, self, health and wealth. Self is how we think, our mindset and our mental health. Health is about the daily disciplines, the rewarding rituals and the happy habits we develop that become the behaviours that are the engines of our success and wealth is what we invest in to attain and sustain our lifestyle. In other words, how we think, what we do and where we invest our time, our energy, and our resources. And I'm a firm believer that sustainable success is an elite team sport over a long-term journey of at least 15-odd years, and not about one-hit wonders or overnight sensations. And in our current times of radical uncertainty, to achieve sustainable success as individuals and in our teams, we need great leaders who are caring change catalysts 
and culture building kings. And if I search for the one person that I think best embodies and demonstrates all of these success traits over his very long and successful career, it's today's very special guest and another one of my virtual mentors, Paul Roos. So I'm really honoured, humbled and very excited to have you on the show today, Paul. So welcome and let's get invested. Thanks, Bushy. Yeah, look, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to have a, a good chat to you. Same too, mate. Now, now Rizzy, you've... You'd have to be living under a rock in Australia not to know who you are, but for those overseas listeners who aren't big AFL fans, can you start by just telling us who you are, what you're currently doing, and why you do what you do, most importantly, mate? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, look, I'm married to an American, so I've spent a little bit of time explaining the game of Australian rules football um, to Tammy and her friends and family and things like that. So, yeah, look, Australian rules football is the equivalent to the National Football League or Premier League soccer or... You know, the the big soccer comps in Europe. Um, so it's, a, it's the biggest sport in Australia. I uh, started as a 17-year-old at Fitzroy when it was sort of semi-professional back in the, the early 80s and then it turned fully professional around about mid-90s when I started playing with the Sydney Swans. So I played 13 years with Fitzroy. I got transferred to Sydney Swans, played for four years there and then I started coaching them in 2002, midway through 2002, coached them for eight and a half years. We were really, really fortunate. We'll, I'm sure we'll touch on it. We won the Premiership, which is the Super Bowl um, or the FA Cup. Um, we won that in 2005, and it was the first time the club had won that in 72 years, so that was incredibly exciting. I took, yeah, it took a bit of a break and then um, got asked to come and coach the Melbourne Football Club, which was which is a very different experience. They were... A you know, really poor team. They'd only won two games and lost twenty the year before, and had about six or seven years of losing. So it was really more of a leadership change, uh, coaching role, and and changing roles at the club and putting good people in. And there was succession plan, and thankfully Melbourne have gone back up the ladder, which is fantastic. So Bushy, is that um, give people enough information? It certainly gives a really good flavour, mate. There's no doubt about it. Now, I guess sort of going right back to uh, your early days, mate, uh, from a very early age, you were clearly a talented sportsman across tennis, basketball and footy. Why did you pursue footy over the other codes? Yeah, I, pl- I played um, in 1979, I think it was, I played in the Victorian basketball state team and the Victorian football state team. So they were the two main sports. I loved the social aspect of tennis. I loved tennis, but I wasn't, I certainly wasn't at the level of, um, you know, Pat Cash or someone like those guys back in those days. But yeah, certainly basketball and football, I guess, I guess it was more of a natural progression. You know, you get invited down to Fitzroy Footy Club, which is one of the main VFL teams back then. And you're just really excited to get part of the system. The basketball system was less obvious back then. There was no NBL. There was a VBL or VBA or whatever it was called. And obviously you could represent your country, but it was pretty hard to sort of see yourself as one of the best 10 or 12 players in Australia to go to the Olympics. Clearly that would have been exciting. The other avenue was to go to college, but not many kids back then would go to college in America. So it was more just natural forces more than anything else. Yeah, I got invited down to Fitzroy, started playing in the under-19s and, you know, and then directed my attention into to AFL football. Yeah, good stuff. Now, do you believe your talent was more about nature or more about nurture or a combination of both? I think a combination of both. I mean, there's no doubt my, my parents had a massive influence. You know, we talk about tennis. My mum and dad were both tennis players. My dad was a football player. Um, my my mum was a really, really good tennis player. Dad, yeah, dad was a good social tennis player and president of the tennis club. So, and where we lived too, I mean, we grew up um, out in Donvale. It was sort of a new um, development out there. A lot of orchards and creeks and outdoor areas, new basketball facilities and, and, and good footy grounds and things like that. So I think it was both. I mean, I think, yeah, I was, I was naturally coordinated and naturally talented, but I spent so many hours practising. You know, we had a basketball ring in the backyard, obviously <laughs> kicking, kicking the footy. Yeah, you know, my, my week would have been... Monday night basketball, Tuesday, Wednesday, sorry, Tuesday football, Wednesday basketball, Thursday football, Friday night basketball, <laughs> Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon basketball, Saturday night basketball and Sunday football. Yeah, that, that really was your week back then. Yeah. And 
you just fit school in to basically learn some stuff and uh, <laughs> spend some time uh, away from sport, I guess. And there was no such thing as homework back then either. We didn't do any homework at all. There was, we didn't have any homework to do. So, um, yeah, my, my whole life was basically immersed in sport. Yeah, love it, mate. Now, you, as you touched on earlier, as a long-term elite player, you played 356-odd games over 17 seasons from 82 right through to 98, and you were Fitzroy's captain for a third of those games. What routines and rituals did you adopt that allowed you to be so successful for so long as a player? Yeah, I think one of the great things about sport, it is very, very structured, you know, so... Yeah, whether you like it or not, you know, you are in a structured environment. So when I started playing at Fitzroy, you know, pre-season, we trained to three mornings a week, um, including Saturday morning, four evenings a week as well. And, you know, so you're really into a routine really early. And, and as I said, we were, we were part-time. So, I'd, you know, pre-season, you get up at six o'clock, you go to training at Kerford Road, which was a beach area, you know, just in near the city. And then you, I'd go to, uh, my first job was at the AMP. Then I'd go to work all day and then I'd come back and train at five o'clock at night. So, yeah, that real structure and discipline was really evident from day one, you know. And you really get into a routine and you stay in a routine. And then really it's how hard you want to work and how much time you want to put in. And, and, and I had really great mentors as well at the Fitzroy Footy Club and I was really, really fortunate that, to have them. Yeah, awesome. What do you think? Uh, allowed you to perform so well for so long under such intense pressure, Paul? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I I think a lot of that comes back to my parents. I think you talked about nature or nurture. I think think that part was probably nature. You know, my dad was, was a really calm person and, you know, quite thoughtful and, you know, my mum was super competitive and I probably got the best of those traits from my parents. So I, I, when I look back now, when you ask me the question, I think it was the ability to stay calm in a really competitive environment and the ability to be competitive when you were com- calm, if that makes sense. So, you know, I think that allowed me to become the player that I, I was able to become because I had a really good mix of those traits from my parents. Mm, some uh, good DNA working for you there, mate. Um, so tell me, you touched on it as well, uh, who were your role models and why did you consider them role models at the time? Yeah, it's interesting. When I, it's only when I look back on it now, when I was about 22, 23, I, I realised how important they were. When I went down there, I don't think we naturally understand how role models are. If we're really smart, we just look at guys and, and girls that do the right thing. So when I went to Fitzroy Footy Club, and I got on the senior list, you know, the, the senior players were Bernie Quinlan, Gary Wilson, Nicky Conlon, Laurie Serafini, Ross Thornton, Lee Carlson, and they were really good people, you know, really, really good people. So, I, you know, I, and I, we say this at Performance by Design, my, my company that I run, and, you know, you ask the newest person in a business what the culture is like, and they'll tell you. They, they won't tell you what's written on a wall. They'll tell you what the behaviours are. So for me, walking into that footy club, we didn't have any you know, values on the wall or behaviours or leadership groups. We just had actions. Now, the actions of those guys were you trained really hard and you got the training on time and you left late and on an optional night you came down to practice your skills and when we, when we socialised together, we were respectful of each other, respectful of other people. When we went on footy trips together, we were respectful of everyone. So I learned that from a really young age and it probably wasn't until... I became captain that I realised how lucky I was to have great role models at the Fitzroy Footy Club. And you talk about sustained success. I mean, I, I walk with those guys on a Sunday morning now. You know, that's 40 years on. I have such a great relationship and they shaped so much of my beliefs as a player and as a coach and as a, as a husband, as a father, you know, all walks of life. So, yeah, they're, they're really, really um, special to me, those guys. Yeah, I bet they were. I have no doubt about it. And some absolute legends with those names you've just mentioned. Mate, you, you were captain at Fitzroy from 88 to 90 and then, then a break back again, 92 to 94. And, you know, as you would know with your business performance by design in, in many sports and businesses, the best technical performers are often appointed as the leaders, but a good performer doesn't necessarily mean you're a good leader. What do you believe you were selected as captain and how did you become captain? Once you became captain, 
did you change at all, if any? And what do you now believe makes a good leader of a team? Yeah, it's interesting. I think captaincy and leadership in sports evolved dramatically. Now, I'm not suggesting I wouldn't have been captain, but I think now we, we, we you know, at Sydney Swans, we, we sort of set up our behaviours first and then we pick our leadership group on the back of the behaviours and then we pick our captain on the back of that. Whereas when I was elected captain, you know, typically it was one of your best players and, and look, most of the time, certainly my, the guys that I followed as captain had great behaviours and were really good leaders. But often it was just, yeah, the, the, the best player on the team or the, the top two or three players in the team sort of thing. But I always felt that the captain always had to be a role model, you know, had to, to train hard, had to play really well on the weekend. Particularly playing was really important because, you know, we didn't spend that much time with each other. We trained really hard, but, you know, the games were really important. The games were important as a captain uh, then. I think now what I realise about captaincy you know, in an AFL sense now and being coach of Sydney and seeing how captaincy evolved, it's probably the whole person, you know, um, being a really good role model off the field, on the field, um, at training now because they're full-time. You know, if you aren't training, you're mentoring other players. So a lot of things that we really didn't have time to do. And your point is incredibly relevant about the corporate world. The corporate world often just picks leadership groups based on technical skills and really it's the biggest mistake you can make. You know, we talk about that. Well, I talk about team and talent, you know, or character and competence or relationship and transaction or whichever way you want to put it. But most, you know, promotions are done based on transaction, you know, based on talent, you know, and, and really once you get to a leadership position, you're not really in the business. You're over the business and you're leading people but that's probably the biggest thing that people find hard to get out of the business and to lead people. But certainly being a good role model, being a good mentor mentor, and, and influencing others is a really important part of it. Yeah, no question about it. And, and you mentioned a couple of times already the importance of setting up the behaviours first and then once you've agreed the behaviours, pick the person who's going to best uh, demonstrate those behaviours and, and just by simply doing that, you eliminate this tendency just to go, well, let's just pick, pick the best player or the best person in the team and, and whack a captain's hat on him or a leader's hat on him and, and then wonder why it doesn't work. Yeah, it, it's funny. When I'm listening to the commentary now or listening to a footy show and someone says, oh, he's the next captain, it's impossible to be outside a footy club now and know who the best captain is. But you look at yeah some of the old school commentators and they still probably don't understand what a captain does and they talk about, you know, oh, he... he you know, the captain's got to lead on the field. Yeah, he does, but there's way more to that. And it's certainly a really important part of it. But yeah, the, the best systems are really clear on what their behaviours are going to be. The best systems then, you know, reward and challenge based on those behaviours, pick their leadership group, and out of that, the captain comes out of that leadership group. And if you get a really strong system like the Sydney Swan system, the Hawthorne system, you know, the Geelong system, yeah, you know, it is sustained success and it, and it endures over a long period of time. Yeah, and, and, and that word system uh, is a really important important uh, reference, I think, too, Rosie, because, uh, uh, you know, in, in sport and in business, uh, the quality and the sustainability of a performance long term comes down to the quality of the, the systems that uh, support it. And if the systems are a bit loose and people aren't too sure about their roles or, as you say, uh, aren't, aren't too clear on what the culture means in terms of how you do things around here. That that's where a lot of the issues arise, I no doubt, and that's that's probably what you're seeing with some of the clubs that you've uh, been assisted uh, assisting with Melbourne and and now most recently North Melbourne, I would imagine. Yeah, you're 100 percent right. I mean, the systems are really really important, and I think a lot of co corporations and certainly some footy clubs just flounder because they they don't put the system in place. And I talk about it all the time: taking the chance out of culture, you know, and and then then acting your way into a system and acting your way out of a system. But if you're not really sure what that system is, then you're leaving your culture to chance. Now, if you get enough good people, you're going to be fine, you know, because they're going to naturally have really good behaviours. But you and I very well know that that's not normally the case, you know. But if you get a really, really clear system in place, it's a lot easier for people to get rewarded and a lot easier for people to get challenged 
and as I said, a lot easier for people to act their way in to the system or act their way out of the system, and it works incredibly well. But you're right, there's still a massive, massive difference between good footy clubs and bad footy clubs and probably even a wider gap between good corporations and bad corporations. Yeah, and I, I think you make a, a really good point there in relation to acting your way in or acting your way out. Uh, and, the, and the reliance also, if you're purely reliant on the quality of the people and that person changes for whatever reason, uh, and then you don't have a system that's going to support that behaviour, then the performance of the individual and the team could drop pretty substantially if it doesn't have that real focus on systems and behaviours. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree. I was speaking to someone, I might, might mention a company, and I was talking to someone the other day, and he, he'd been in a couple of really, really huge corporations, and we were talking about his leadership journey, and he said, oh, look, when such and such was the leader of this organisation, it was just terrible, absolutely terrible. And then he mentioned the other guy's name who came in and became the CEO, and he said, I just turned it around. But then the problem, which, which what he said is, Unfortunately, the, the really, really good CEO didn't put the systems in place. So then, of course, when the next CEO arrived, the place went to, to garbage again. You know, so you're right. All it was, it was relying on the CEO, their, their personality and their behaviours. If they were really good and people emulated them, then the company became really positive. If they were poor, then the company just dropped off again. So they hadn't done anything around harnessing those behaviours, harnessing those systems and understanding what made them great, and then all of a sudden the, the, the person changed and they just went down the toilet again. So you're 100% right. Yeah, okay. Now, but I wouldn't mind just delving in very briefly into a couple of the, the lowlights and the highlights of your playing career, if you don't mind. Uh, and yep. There's one of them that stands out for me. You know, During the off-season in 1990, as I understand it, you were overseas in the US and you got a call from your manager to say that Fitzroy was going to cut your pay by a third and you are being traded to Collingwood. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but at the time you'd been the Fitzroy captain for two or three years, you'd won the club's best and fairest twice, you'd achieved all Australian honours at least three times, you'd been the club's highest goal kicker that season, I think, and, and you won the league's most valuable player. So tell us about what happened at that time, how it made you feel, and what did you do, and, and most importantly, what did you learn from it? Yeah, I, I might back up a little bit just to give the people a bit of context, particularly the people that, that don't know Australian rules football. So about seven games to go in 1986, um, our president, Leon Wigard, came to us on a Sunday morning. We were training at Wesley College, just on a tennis court, just doing a, a recovery session. He said, guys, I've got some really bad news. Um, we're going to fold at the end of the season. We can relocate to Brisbane. They're looking at a new team. Or we'll merge with a Melbourne-based club. Um, so we... On the back of that, we won six of our last seven games, made the finals, and the club was saved. I think it was a company called Hecron, which is a building company. So really post that, things were really precarious from a financial point of view. So we were sort of aware of the situation with the club, and whilst they always paid us, there was a lot of, you know, we had to move our payments back, and some guys got deferred by months, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So it was a really difficult period. Yeah, yeah so I was overseas at the end of 1990, and I got a phone call from Damien Smith, the manager, my long-term manager, and he said, oh, look, you're sitting down. I said, why? He goes, and I was captain of the footy club. Um, he said, look, the club wants you to take a 33% pay cut, or they'll trade you the club of your choice or they'll delist you. I'm like, are you kidding me? So no one. So he said, look, and just so you know, Collingwood are really keen for you to come. They reckon they can do a deal with, with Fitzroy. I got a phone call from um, uh, Lee Matthews, I think it was the time, was coaching. They just won the premiership. Um, never did I get a phone call from Fitz, anyone at Fitzroy, which was – and then um, Damien said, look, do you want to come back? Um, Collingwood are – you know, there's the contract, you want to come back? I said, yeah, look, if I'm going to get traded, I want to be back in Australia. And so I flew all the way back um, with Tammy, flew back to Australia. We were sitting around. Still no one from Fitzroy had contacted me at all. Um, and I was sitting there waiting, waiting. The deadline went past, got a phone call from Collingwood saying that we just couldn't get anyone from Fitzroy, none of the players. Um, sorry, we couldn't get anyone from Collingwood to go to Fitzroy. So we couldn't actually get a trade done because we couldn't, none of our players would go to Fitzroy because everyone was aware, you know, how um, financially strapped the club was. So that Collingwood couldn't get anyone to go there. Uh, trade period had finished. I actually picked up the phone and I rang 
the Fitzroy Footy Club, and I spoke to the CEO. I said, well, what's the deal? He said, no, nah, OK, we're going to honour your contract. I said, well, look, I'm going to head back to America. They said, yeah, that's fine. So I took off again, but it was only that I rang them. And then that's when I resigned as, a, as captaincy. I resigned the captaincy that year, and I said, well, look, if you don't want me as a player, um, then I, don't, I can hardly be the coach of the, uh, the captain of the footy club. Uh, Robert Shaw came in, who was a new coach, so he wasn't part of it. And then the, the CEO changed, and I think the, the board changed, and then at the end of that year, I signed on again for, I think, for another three years. So, look, all was sort of forgotten, but it was, yeah, it was a pretty tough period and a really difficult period in, in the club. Uh, did it demotivate you? I mean, it, a couple of things there that stand out for me. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about how I run a business, Paul, and uh, for uh, my best team member to find out from someone else that uh, pretty much they, they, they're going to slice your pain and, and flick you somewhere else would have been uh, pretty devastating. It's, it's, you know, Management 101 would tell you that it's not a smart move. Uh, why is it, do you think, that you, you found out that second hand, so to speak, and, and flowing on from that, how did that affect your motivation? Because, I mean, I, I, I've seen people in similar, similar situations, they either quit and go or they, worse still, they quit and stay. And in, and in staying, because you're demotivated, it, it, it still has an ongoing impact on how you perform and how the team performs. How did that relate to you? Yeah, look, I probably learned a lot of not what to do from a leadership point of view from that period because you're right. I mean, some of the things were just I couldn't believe, you know, like the fact that I was captain of the club and had been there and won a couple of best and fairest, had been a pretty good player and then no one bothered to ring me. So I did learn a lot around leadership and what it is and what it isn't. So whilst it was a difficult period then, it was probably something that when I look back on, I go, well, this is what I'm never going to do. You know, I'm never going to do some things like that. Um, <laughs> and I think, I think coming back, it's about personal pride. It's about what your standards are, what your values are and not letting other people control that. And as I said, we had a new coach come in and, you know, so I was able to put that aside and, and I had great teammates, great friends within the team. So you sort of compartmentalise that and you say, well, okay, even though the club itself doesn't want me, you know, that's not the case with the coach, that's not the coach case with the players. But I did resign from the captaincy, so I was really disappointed in the footy club. Um, but I was able to put that aside and personal motivation, personal pride and, you know, I was able to have a pretty good year in 91 and 92 and, you know, was able to put that behind me. But, yeah, look, it's certainly very difficult when you, 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 you're sort of not valued and you, you're coming back to the club. Yeah, yeah. Now, one of the other, I guess, low lights, and this is me looking in from the outside because I've read in your book, here it is, that in your last season with the Swans, for the first time in your whole career, you spent roughly 10 games on the bench. How did that make you feel and, and what did you learn from that experience at the end of your career, Paul? Yeah, so the last last 10 games, um, I started, you know, on the, a lot of them on the bench and um, I did learn a lot. It was actually a really good period because and, – and at the end of 1998, I actually wrote down a lot of things I liked about the leaders and didn't like about the leaders that I had and I think that was prompted by probably a, a new way to look at footy. You know, prior to that, I'd been picked first every week or second or the you know, top half dozen and – won best and fairest and being captain. But suddenly, yeah, your your skills, you know, your, your athletic talent is waning. I was 35 years of age. And it's actually interesting because it put myself in a different shoes. And I started to think, gee, not everyone is really confident going the game every week. So it was it enabled me to look at footy from a different point of view. So whilst it was frustrating and disappointing, yeah, it was probably one of the best things that happened, you know. And, um I, I worked my way through it and still was able to play some reasonable footy and probably didn't agree with some of the things that Rocket was doing. But, you know, he was the coach and, look, he was pretty good at communicating and, you know, there was never never too many too much angst or anything like that. So, but, yeah, it led, led me to write down my, my leadership code and my, my 25 points it turned out to be and it was the best thing I did. And I had it in my desk for eight and a half years at um, Sydney and three years when I was at the, the Melbourne Footy Club, and I learned a lot through that period. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's quite often the, the hardship and the challenges that teach us the most I've found in, on my own journey, Paul, and, uh, you know, I, I'm a, it's still a, a mad keen field hockey player, and at the tender age of 60, I'm, I'm nowhere near as fast or as, as sharp as what I used to be, but I'm still out there running around with the boys, and, and quite often now, uh, you know, the 
brain knows where I want to be, but the body's a couple of seconds behind me, Paul. And uh, d- dealing with the expectations of the other players around me, and and you know, I, I quite often rest myself because I just don't have the legs that the younger guys do. Uh, that's been quite challenging for me, but learning a lot about how I need to come into a game without putting massive expectations on myself, and it, 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 you know, in learning that in terms of how you were then going into the coaching role and then treating those players to keep them motivated and focused would have been. Uh, pretty useful I would have thought yeah and I always encourage when we're talking to exec teams and leaders I actually always encourage them to do that now themselves even though they're in a leadership position so you're right so I take yourself back take yourself what it was like to be you know when you first walked into the bank or you first worked into the accountant firm you're working and and what you liked about your leaders and what you didn't like about your leaders so I mean every opportunity is a learning opportunity you know whether that's <clears throat> learning from winning or learning from failure. So you're absolutely right. And and it's also a- adapting. What you're doing now is, you know, well, I, I compliment you on continuing to play and enjoying playing, but you are also got to adapt, don't you? You've got to sort of say, well, I love the game and I love playing and I try and play my boys in tennis and basketball. But you've got to start, your brain's got to start to work more, doesn't it? You know, you've got to start to think, well, what's that young person thinking? Where are they going to go? So, yeah, it, it is really fascinating when you continue playing sport and you know i'm 58 so yeah your brain's working a lot harder than what it was when you were when you were playing at 25 i can assure you yeah no, just on that subject i something i've noticed is interesting and I, I spoke to mark bickley about this when i had him on the podcast a while back uh, you know once most players retire from afl level uh, I, many of them never play the game again i'm just interested in why that is, and you know, if you, if you love the game so much and the, you enjoy the camaraderie, why would you walk away from it totally? I mean, a bit different in your case because you've gone on with coaching and commentating and you've still got an active involvement in the game from that level, but uh, it's always intrigued me, mate. What's your thoughts around that? Yeah, probably a couple of things. I actually started playing basketball again, so I, I that was my outlet. My I played really high level of basketball, so I absolutely loved it. So I was able to to fulfil a bit of a childhood dream of I stopped playing basketball when I was, was sort of 17, 18. So I went back to basketball and, and played some really high level and I really, really enjoyed that. I think there's a safety factor in, in AFL footy. I, I think I think for me probably personally it was a case of, well, I've got through 17 years, yeah, with a few injuries but nothing dramatic. I, I think given the physicality of the game, I think that's the main thing. I think it's just the fear of... Yeah. Well, what if I do a knee or break a leg or, you know, do something like that? Um, and I think, you know, some do. You know, Boomer Harvey's still playing now, which is great. And, right. and and some do. But I think largely I think largely it's just the fear of getting injured when you've been through a system and, and sort of got through the system relatively unscathed. You just don't want to put yourself in that position again. Yeah, that's that's a good call. I, and I, I hadn't... It, physicality at that level and having the support to, to going into a situation where it's probably a little bit more amateur and then you're more exposed to potential injury risks is probably a pretty good deterrent. I hadn't thought about that aspect. But uh, let's turn now to uh, your coaching and leadership career, uh, you know, because I've often said that the two worst jobs in Australia, I believe, are an AFL coach or a politician, because if you're winning, it's the players who get the credit, but if you're losing, it's always the coach's fault, the coach's fault. Um, a couple of questions. Why did you decide to become a coach? Is it something you were approached and groomed to do or was it something that you wanted to do? Yeah, so I went overseas in 1999 and lived with um, my wife, Tammy's family, and I I just didn't want to, when I say waste the year, it was a fantastic year with Tammy's family, but I wanted to learn some stuff. So I actually went around, I went to Chicago Bears, Chicago Bulls, the 49ers, Denver Broncos, um, San Diego Chargers, LA Lakers. So I had a really good year, a really good learning year. So that was – and then I came back in 2000. I did some part-time commentary for Seven and also worked on the Olympics for C7, which was their paid TV. And I, I did some part-time work for Sydney as an assistant defensive coach. I then had to make the decision to the start of 2001. And I, I really – I had a passion for footy still. I wasn't sure whether I wanted to be a senior coach, but I certainly had a passion for – for footy, so I decided to take a full time role, and I thought, well, I'll I'll, I'll bide my time, I'll I'll enjoy it, I'll help rock it as much as I can, try and be as successful as I possibly can, and then midway through two thousand and two, Rocket 
decide to give it away. And it was sort of more thrust upon me, to be honest. And then it was really the next 10 rounds that I really got a thirst for it, really enjoyed the interim role, and I sort of threw my hat in the ring. So, yeah, it sort of evolved like that, really. There was no conscious decision to do it other than the fact that when I took the job in the interim phase, I, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the interaction with the players. I enjoyed the coaching side of it. And, uh, yeah, I put my hat in the ring at the end of 2002. Well, that's jumping right in there. When you took over as coach of the Swans in 2002, the, the side experienced an almost overnight turnaround, making every finals from 2003 to 2008 and winning that historic grand final in 2005. What did you do differently that, that really helped achieve this? Yeah, look, I could have set them a really good platform. We played in the grand final in 96 and played in finals. But probably the main thing was empowering the players. I think that was the biggest difference. You know, I had a, I had a concept in my mind and I, I thought, why aren't the players more involved in decision-making? Why is it not more of a collective agreement? Why does it have to be coach versus players or coach telling players all the time? So I had this sort of philosophy in the back of my mind and I was able to implement it. And thankfully, the players really embraced it. We talked about it before. We went we went down to Coffs Harbour. We we set our standards and our behaviours and we wanted to stand for as a leadership group and a footy club and a team. Then we picked our leadership team. The players did that. And then out of that, we picked Stewie Maxfield. And it was really groundbreaking from an AFL point of view, you know, the change that, that Sydney led in that, in that field. And I think that was the biggest thing. The players really embraced it. They said, yeah, we want to drive this footy club. We want to be part of the footy club. We want to be part of the decision-making. And part of that is we want to own the responsibility of where this footy club goes, you know. And they did a great job. They, they were able to do it. And as you said, we you know, we went from being a, a mediocre team to a premiership team in a, a, a really short space of time. Yeah, it was remarkable. Uh, tell me, uh, just again from the outside looking in, it appears that many clubs and, and supporters still expect very quick results from coaches. And coaches end up, quite often, I believe, being the scope, scapegoats for a club's performance. Why are coaches so dispensable and, and how do we educate organisations generally to appreciate that achieving sustainable success is actually a long-term endeavour? Yeah, it's funny, you're right. I mean, I always say this, it's sort of like if I said to you, um, I don't know, let's say it's a car dealership and I said normally, yeah, normally you get a footy team when they're at the bottom. So if I said to you, um, you know, I'll buy my car dealership, it loses $20 million a year. Um, and, yeah, not only you have to do that, well, you're going to have to take the, the sales manager, the general manager, the head of, um, you know, service department, et cetera, et cetera. You'd go, hang on, I'm not, bu- I'm, not, I'm not buying that. What are you talking about? Yet we're asking, we're typically asking coaches to do exactly that, you know. Um, but it's a, to, and the point I'm making is it's a whole of club. If you think it's just about changing a coach, well, you're kidding yourself. Yeah, it's about the chairman. It's about the CEO. It's about the footy manager. It's about the the recruiting manager, the assistant coaches. So it's about getting the key influences right. You know, it's not as simple as you think. If you think it's as simple as changing a club, and to your point, it's exactly the same in business. You know, you've got to get all your key stakeholders right, your key influences right, your role model leaders. Yeah, and we did that at Sydney. Andrew Island was fantastic. Miles Barron Hay. Cole Siri, um, our recruiting team, our assistant coaches, and then that's what I tried to do at, at Melbourne. You know, I would never have taken the Melbourne job had Peter Jackson said you have to take all the people, you know, at the footy club. Um, I brought in my own assistant coaches. I knew David Misson. He was already there. He was my, my fitness coach at Sydney. Had enormous amount of trust in him. Knew Todd Viney from playing with him state footy and sorry against him, um, and. It's a whole of club thing. So, yeah, it's just easy, to your point. It's easy to put a coach in without surrounding with his own people or people that he trusts, and then we ask him to do the job, and then the easier thing is just to get rid of him and put someone else in. You know, there's a lot of people that don't really know what they're doing, you know, that are running footy clubs um, around and, and, you know, corporations, to be honest. So um, get the right people and get really good people, you know, Success is going to follow, but it's a process. You know, again, same as business. You're not going to turn around that twenty million dollar loss in one year. You're going to build it up over time. But yeah, you know, the difference is our our results on the Monday's paper every Monday morning, and there's a ladder, and and it's an emotional business, and people get emotional. And the easiest thing is to sack your coach. 
Yeah, yep, spot on. Uh, we've been talking quite a bit about sustainable success. How, how do you define it and how do you believe you achieve it? I think it's defined by your your values and what you stand for as either an individual or as certainly as a footy club. You know, I think if you look at um, the Sydney Swans as, as, as what we, we started with John Longmire was my assistant coach back in 2002, end of 2002. Yeah, it's, it's a values-based footy club. You know, I talk about behavioural-based footy clubs or talent-based footy clubs. It's the same in corporation. You know, sustained success is built around behaviours, is built around what our actions are. So when we come into an organisation, we see it. We see people turning up to meetings on time. We see them putting their cameras on in Zoom or whatever it is when you've got a meeting. We see them returning people's phone calls. We see them saying hello and goodbye and socialising together and all that sort of stuff. That, that's what sustained success is built on. It's a process and it's monotonous and it's boring, but it, rel- it, it leads to sustained success. Yeah, talent-based teams just rely on the best product, the best talent, um, best economy. Yeah, when things are going well, they're flying. When things aren't going well, yeah, they're struggling because it's all about the individual. It's not about the team. Um, and that's one of the biggest tests. You know, under pressure, do you do what's best for yourself or do you do what's best for the, your team? I mean, there's never been a greater example at the moment in Australian politics than, than that example, you know. Um, and it's the same in business, same in footy. Under pressure, do you do what's best for yourself or do you do what's best for your team? And great teams always do what's best for their team. Great leaders always do what's best for their team. Yeah, it's extremely well said there, mate. Mate, I'd, I'd love to just to drill in a little bit into a couple of the the lowlights and the highlights of your time as a as a coach, and uh, I'm going to focus on what I consider to be a pretty pivotal year, and that's 2005. And I'd say that for a couple of reasons, Paul, because um, starting with a low light in the lead up to the 2005 grand final win, the CEO of the AFL publicly criticised you and the Swans by saying that your style of play was disgusting and ugly. I think were the words, and that you'd never win a premiership playing that sort of unattractive style of footy. How did that make you feel and how did you and the players respond to that? Yeah, it was pretty bizarre. So, again, just for recapping, I think it was about round five or six. So, ironically, we played the Eagles and we were in West Australia and on the radio he said something about the Swans' ugly footy and they'll never pre- win a premiership playing like that. Uh, you know, for those overseas people, to me, uh, the, the analogy I use is it'd be like the CEO of Coca-Cola saying, look, don't drink Coca-Cola in in New South Wales, drink Pepsi. Yeah, because we, we were the only team in New South Wales and we were representing the whole of the AFL. There was only one team and that was the Sydney Swans. So it was just probably firstly I thought it was a really bizarre thing to say. Secondly, I thought there was a lack of leadership from the commission, which is sort of, the, if you want to, for want of a better term, it's the board of the AFL that didn't come out and sort of say, hang on, that's not the way we want our CEO to, to operate. You know, that's just not on sort of thing. So... And thirdly, it probably was more of an external issue, but we did use it to galvanise the players. And, you know, we, we felt as a club we were sort of abandoned a little bit by the AFL and we felt as the flagship club and the club that was sort of trying to develop the game in New South Wales, we deserved better than that. But but ultimately, yeah, we just needed to play better footy. We needed to, to, to you know, look after our own backyard and we needed to play better than what we were. Um, and it turned out we did, and it turned out things worked pretty well for us. Might have been a good catalyst to uh, galvanise, as you say, the, the players against a, a sort of a common foe, if you like, that gave them that extra motivation to uh, really lift. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, look, it was, it was strange, you know, and, and I think we were close, like, coaching group and player group, and I, I certainly think it helped our cause rather than hindered the cause, to be honest. Yeah, now, on that very same year, mate, with a very historic year, the 2005 season was also a big one for our family, Paul, because our great-grandfather, Ron Burrows, played for South Melbourne in the uh, late 1920s, and he was the, actually the vice president of the club when they won the flag in 1933. And uh, my good father, the uh, original Bushy Senior, God bless him, he was an absolute die-hard Swan supporter, and he waited all of his life to see another premiership, mate. But unfortunately, he passed away just five months before you won the flag. But my brother Ian, who went absolutely nuts on the footy show that the week before the grand final when he was interviewed by Eddie, 
uh, was convinced that the freaky goal that Nick Davis kicked in the dying seconds of the semi-final to win the game was actually the spirit of my good father. Now, how big a moment was winning that game for you and, and the club, given it was the first final in 72 years with you as a coach? How did you feel and, and what did you learn from that experience? Yeah, look, it's it's still pretty um, emotional because, it, it, to your point, you know, there's so many stories like your story and, again, putting the context for overseas, uh, you know, the, the build-up, you know, over the previous three, four, five years when we'd started to become more successful was, you know, the Swans haven't won a premise for 68 years, 69 years, 70 years, 71, 72. So, yeah, there was a lot of talk around going into that game. The Swans haven't won a premiership for 72 years. and It was the longest premiership drought in our competition in AFL. So I think we we're aware of it. There's, there's no question. But we, we sort of really stuck to the process. We spoke about what we wanted to do. And it probably wasn't until we won the game that I realised the enormity of what we'd achieved. I remember walking through the grandstand in those days the the coach's box was in the grandstand you walk through the grandstand I remember looking at all the swans faces the fans i got on the ground and past players past president past people that had put money in the club you know paul kelly gave me the cup and then we went to the function that night um the emotion of so many people the stories that you've been telling me um the next day we went to the Lakeside Oval and it was absolutely packed with all the South Melbourne people there and, you know, the people had waited so long for the for the grand final. We then went back to Sydney and we did a parade through Sydney, which is incredible. As I said, you know, AFL football, we were the only team in town. It was more a rugby league, rugby union town. Yeah. But it was probably even even to this day, mate, like, like even now, 18 years, you know, what is it, 16 years later, you know, I still hear stories about that, and and that's probably the most emotional thing. The number of emails and messages I got afterwards, like thanking me. You know, I went to the footy with my dad and my mum, and yeah, you know, they were eighty two years of age, and they've since passed away. And it was the greatest, yeah, you know, greatest day of my life. As it's still, yeah, I think yeah, you know, what football does to people, and the, and what it means to people, and and that really put in perspective of how big it was. Um, for, and, and also, as I said before, how big it was, and, and it wasn't created by me or Brett Kirk or Barry Hall, it was created by you know, Barry Round and Bobby Skilton and the people you've mentioned, you know, going back years and years and years of history. There's so much hard work went into that. The pioneers that left um, South Melbourne to go to Sydney in you know, 81 or 82 when it was, yeah, so there was a lot, a lot of people that were, were affected in a real positive way so yeah still to this day it's something i'm really proud of the whole footy club and and everyone associated with that day yeah it was an amazing day mate uh yeah and we, we yeah i'd still get emotional uh, every time i look at the replay of that that nick davis goal i'd, I'd tear up actually yeah that, that that's how uh, engaging the whole exercise was and and you know what it meant to us as a family so uh, you, you know take my hat off to you and commend you for the work you did to bring all that together, mate. But um, changing tack a little bit, uh, accountability is something that's unfortunately very sadly missed in a lot of organisations around the country. How important do you believe personal and collective accountability is to success and how do you instil it? Yeah, I think it, it's dramatically lacking. You, let's be really honest, you're right. It's dramatically lacking in this landscape at the moment. And just to give people perspective on that, um, a footy club is a really accountable place. It's a safe place, but it's a really accountable place. You know, we set up our values, we set up our behaviours, we set up our KPIs, our technical KPIs, and we constantly reward and challenge. It's the whole environment at the Sydney Swans, the whole environment I set up at the Melbourne Footy Club, the whole environment that David Noble's trying to set up at the North Melbourne Football Club now. It's all around accountability. You know, it's all around personal responsibility. And probably the biggest thing we're being let down in Australia at the moment is just a lack of accountability for our politicians. You know, it's really, really sad. But I guess it's been building for many, many years. If you're not used to an accountable model, and you've lived in an unaccountable system for so long, it's hard to change. But personal accountability, firstly, and then team, club, or corporate accountability. And if you can get that right, 
you know, it's incredibly rewarding, incredibly powerful. Um, yeah, it's challenging and can be frustrating at times and having honest, real, we, we call it real talk, you know, just have real talk conversations over and over and over again. But to be perfectly frank, if you want to be a high-performing team, a high-performing individual, a high-performing state, country, you know, corporation, whatever it is, you know, you have to have an enormous level of personal accountability and, and team accountability. Yeah, one hundred percent agree, mate. I'd, just shifting gears a little bit, I sort of want to sort of focus on the health component a little bit because uh, you've often said that as a leader, your personal health determines the health of the organisation. And under the immense, all-consuming pressure of being an AFL coach, how did you keep yourself healthy during those years, and and how do you continue to keep yourself health, healthy now? Yeah, yeah. I think I mean I learned that obviously I was in a healthy environment, so in terms of running and lifting weights and and diet and stuff like that i mean so movement's always been a really big part of my life and and just getting into consistent habits but i think the meditation i learned to meditate with tammy my wife who's a meditation teacher 25 years ago so that that's sort of the brain part of it well as well so that's that mindfulness meditation and we brought that into the sydney swans back in 2003 so i, I think for me it's just about habits and when i was coaching it, it i think we one of the terms I don't like is work-life balance. I call it I call it life balance. Yeah. Because I don't leave home and go to the Melbourne Footy Club when I was coaching Melbourne in the last three years and not have a wife and kids. And I don't leave the Melbourne Footy Club and come home and not have a job. You know. So so what I talk about is life balance. So it's actually about those moments within your life. Yeah. So we've finished training at um, Melbourne Footy Club and I'd go for a run around the town, you know, just a long way back to the office, you know, an extra 4K, but it was a long way back to the office. Then I'd get to the office, have a shower. Yeah, so whatever you can do within, my message is whatever you can do within your life, just do it because as a leader in particular, people want you to turn up healthy. They want you to turn up really well balanced because you're there to lead them. And if you don't, then you're going to get frustrated, they'll get frustrated. So, he, again, it comes back to personal accountability. It's funny, the analogy that I use is, you know, when your little red light goes off in your car with the oil light, you can't get it to the service department quick enough. <laughs> yeah. But, but, it, but, it, but it's something happens in our own lives. We just don't look after ourselves anywhere near the way we should. And if we start to do that, a lot of the problems that we do have in the world today are going to suddenly be be gone, but we're going about it completely the wrong way. Yeah, one hundred percent agree, um, mate. You, you've often been called the Zen master of football, and you you always come across as calm, confident, and collected, as as well as patient and persistent. Uh, where is that sort of self belief and quiet self confidence stem from, and and how important is Tammy in that regard? Yeah, look, we've done everything as a family. I think that's really important. Again, talking about that work-life balance, and I hear this a lot, you know. You know we're, I remember talking to Tammy and the kids. The kids were only little when I took the, the Sydney job and, you know, oh, Dad, we'll never see you, blah, 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 blah. But we had a discussion as a family. Ironically, when I gave it away at Sydney, the boys were both, no, Dad, please don't give it away. We love it, you know, it's, it's the way. Yeah, so it's actually quite interesting, but, yeah. As I said, Tammy's a meditation teacher. She does some coaching, some life coaching as well to the CEOs, executives. She worked with me at, at Sydney with some of the players, you know, some of our real high performers, Brett Kirk, Adam Goods, um, Mickey O, Craig Bolton, et cetera, et cetera, and then came into the Melbourne Football Club. We did a lot of meditation, a lot of visualisation at the Melbourne Footy Club, and she really helped transform that organisation as well. And, yeah, just, you know, we, we get on really well and we have a great relationship and we do everything yeah, together when we discuss everything. So, yeah, when you've got a really good balanced lifestyle and a good support network um, at home, it makes a the world of difference. Yeah, no doubt, mate. I'm exactly the same. I'm, I'm blessed with my uh, good wife, and we're the yin and yang. We were just a great balance to each other, and uh, you know, there's just no way I'd be enjoying the life we we do if it hadn't been for that partnership, mate. Um, uh, you sort of become a bit of a mix of Mister Fix It. In, in the AFL, you know, following your success at the Swans, you've you know, got that growing reputation as a change catalyst and a culture building king and and you've really done some fantastic foundational re rebuilding work with Melbourne and, and now I assume at North Melbourne. What's the essence of your success in taking underperforming teams and, and transforming them 
uh, to achieve great things. I mean, I know you've touched on quite a few of them already, but if you summarise that for us. Yeah, absolutely. I, I sort of got asked that question the other day and probably try to put it into perspective. I think when I arrived at Sydney, you're sort of flying by the seat of your pants a bit. <laughs> you're sort of first coach and you go, well, I think this is going to work. And you sort of have a philosophy and a game plan and, as I said, empowerment of the players. And, and you're sort of hoping more than anything. And, yeah, I got through the premiership in 2005 and had a lot of success at Sydney um, with with great people. So by the time I left that job, I no longer guess, you know, and I don't say this, you know, hopefully not in an arrogant way. I, I know what success looks like. And I think I think once you've done it and once you fully understand it, and I know it's hard and, and I know it's not just about the coach. And I think, I think the thing that I learned in eight and a half years at Sydney with great mentors, Andrew Ireland, Johnny Longmire as assistant coach, Rossi Lyon, Johnny Blakey. Yeah, I could go through multiple, multiple names. And so I think having done what I did at Sydney, I really know what success looks like now. And I couldn't have done the Melbourne job. No, no chance could I have done the Melbourne job had I not coached Sydney. But going to Melbourne, having the confidence, understanding the pillars you have to put in place, understanding the process you have to put in place. And I think that allowed me to take the, the role at, and, and Benny Buckley is a good friend of mine who's the chairman of the, the North Melbourne Football Club so I think you know the confidence to be able to do that working with good people I think they have confidence in me but yeah look it's experience I guess and it's it's making mistakes when you're a coach and learning from those mistakes but having a full understanding of the industry a full understanding of what success looked like um, I think that's why yeah, I'm able to go into not only footy clubs but into organisations and and to see them and and see what's working really really well and see what they can what they can do better. Mm, just sort of on an allied subject there, yeah, uh, uh, sustaining yes. success long term in a very hyper competitive environment like AFL seems to be a challenge. And you know, if we look at Richmond at the moment, they've won three out of four flags, but they they're really starting to to struggle. Uh, what do you think that is and and what do they need to do to reinvigorate their performance, do you believe? Yeah, I think yeah, there's obviously a, a an age component and a, a physical component we've touched on to AFL football. So there's sort of a natural yeah, progression from a, a top team. I guess the challenge is probably to never become a bottom team. Yeah, and I think that's Richmond's challenge and I don't think they will be. I certainly haven't written them off for this year. But they've just got to physically reignite, you know, stick to their behaviour, stick to what makes them good, you know, understand what makes them good. And, and again, it's monotonous, but just keep going back to that over and over and over again. And successful organisations do that. They go back to their values. They go back to their behaviours. And then they start to, you know, induct new people based around them. They bring people in that have got similar values and similar standards. You know, I'm sure Richmond will do that. Um, so it really is, to me, again, getting back to a behavioural-based team or a talent-based team, you know, getting back to the Swans again. No one thought the Swans was going to be like they were this year, but they get back to their behaviours. They get back to Joey Kennedy as a great leader and Luke Parker and Dane Rampey and, and the young players jump on board and they, they, they see it, they emulate it, they do it. You know, Trent Cotchin, great leader, great person. You know, he'll, he'll, he'll know what to do and he'll be telling those players what to do. You know, so I'm confident Richmond, you know, will, will they win the premiership this year? No, I'm, I'm very unlikely, but I can't see them botting, botting them out as an organisation. I can see them coming back relatively quickly. Yeah, no, yep, awesome. Mate, um, in your current business, Performance by Design, which parallels our own focus on living by design, you've no doubt observed that leadership in all areas has gone through a massive evolution, evolution over the last few decades from that sort of top-down command and control style dictatorship to a bottom-up caring circle of safety democracy style of approach. Why do you think this is the case and what further changes in leadership style need to evolve, do you think, to handle the current and ongoing radical uncertainty that the world is currently experiencing? Yeah, I think the the, the, the top-down just wasn't working, wasn't it? I mean, we've got a new generation of people coming in that, that really want to know. They're, they're not as focused necessarily on money. They want to know what their purpose is. What? Why does this company exist? You know, why am I here? Which I think is a great thing. So then it forced really leaders to sort of start to think around their role. Yeah, so you talked about it really well. You articulated well. It's it's now a empowerment democratic, and I think it's got to continue that way. And, and leaders that 
that are still top down and control and command, they're, they're going to get phased out over time. And, and we see it all the time because what it creates, it creates a stifled, stuffy, you know, uh, low performing environment because people don't feel safe. They don't want to put up their ideas. They don't want to reward people. They don't want to challenge people. Yeah, so it becomes, and, and what we know based on research, research is in a low performing team, the first people to leave are your best team members because they have they have the most self worth and they're not going to sit there and put up with the garbage from the CEO or the coach or the captain or the leader or whatever. They're going to say, well, my self worth is far too great to to be at this organisation, and they tend to leave. So your your culture gets further eroded um, the more those good people that leave. Alternatively, I talk about this as well. Culture travels. You and I know that culture travels. You know, people go, geez, I'd love to work with that organisation. I actually don't really know, but everyone seems to be enjoying it. Um, I talked to someone at a barbecue the other night and they said this is what they do at that organisation. So good culture travels and poor culture travels. Good culture, people start ringing you. Can I come and work for you? Yeah, I don't know what you're doing, but it seems like it's really, really good. So, yeah, this notion of empowerment, belonging, People want to come to work now to, to belong. They want to be part of building something and they want to be building it together, not having someone else build it for them, which is that old command control way of doing things. Yeah, and no, I love that, mate. Um, but I, I sort of want to pivot now into a subject that's close to both of our hearts and that's the subject of men's mental health and well-being. Uh, and to use a, a, a reasonably current example, one of your former Swan player prodigies, Reese Shaw, struggled during his turbulent time coaching North Melbourne, and uh, there were a lot of concerns around his mental health. Now, I know that men's health and wellness is a key focus for you and your family with the Bruce Men's Wellness and Leadership Club and your nurture group work. What are the challenges that you do you think that men face in a world where to some degree, the PC pendulum appears to have swung a bit too far and, and men seem to be suffering a bit of an identity struggle with how to define what actually being a modern man is. And there's this struggle between the, the vulnerability on this spectrum from the sort of the macho to the emotive. So what can men do about overcoming some of these uh, challenges, do you think? Yeah, I think you mentioned the stereotype, mate. I think you're really right. I mean, you and I are similar age, 58, 60. And if you look at our fathers, and I'll speak to mine, really, my dad was a fantastic guy, you know, really, really good guy. But we didn't talk a lot about feelings, you know. We, you know, he came to the footy matches all the time, was incredibly supportive. We played tennis, you know. But he wasn't really a... A, a speaking man around. So what we've got to do is just change the notion of what uh, a man is. And, you know, my son's involved in a business called Momentum Lifestyle and they're doing just that. And there's a lot of good organisations out there. So what is a man? Because I think you're right. I think we're a little bit betwixt and between at the moment, you know, but we've got to redefine what a man is. You know, a man can be open. Yeah, you know, a man can talk. Instead of talking to his mates of how are you and how's the footy, it's about having the conversations. You know, Bushy, how are you, mate? I, I really noticed you were down yesterday. You know, is everything okay? And, and you being, you know, comfortable enough with me to say, yeah, look, Reason, thanks, thanks for asking. Yeah, you know, I am struggling. You know, uh, you know, this happened on the weekend and, you know, oh, mate, look, can I, I think those conversations have started to happen, aren't they? I think that's, yeah. the, that's the good thing. So we've just got to keep that moving forward. And I say this all the time, and I don't say this with any disrespect to my dad. I, you know, I'm hoping I'm a better man and father and husband than my father was. And I hope that Dylan and Tyler are a better husband, father and man than I, I am. You know, that, that's my big hope for them um, because we've got to keep pushing this notion forward of, of what that looks like and we're going to start to sort of redefine those stereotypes of when you and I were young and we were looking at our dads and they couldn't, you know, couldn't cry and, and had to go to work and be stoic and, you know, hide everything and, and all those sorts of things. Thankfully, that's all changing. We've got to keep that conversation going, don't we? Yeah, absolutely, mate. Mate, just jumping very quickly into the future before I uh, segue into the what I call the ambush bushfire lightning round, Yep. Uh, like me, you now appear to be shifting your sights from success to significance 
in your life, uh, as, as, as we both enter the final quarter of our lives, mate. Uh, paint us a picture of your ideal uh, lifestyle and world moving forward uh, in terms of what you're doing and, and where you're doing it and how, how does your various biz- business interests of performance by design, the Nurture Group and the, the Men's Wellness and Leadership Club fit into that? Yeah, it's a, it's a good point, isn't it? Like when you get to our age, you start to think a little bit differently or, around what you're, you're, you're doing. And I guess probably my philosophy now is I've been really fortunate to gain an enormous amount of information in, you know, through the experience I've had. And that's through, you know, through my, my upbringing, through being at Fitzroy Footy Club, through working, you know, up until I was full time in 95 with the Sydney Swans, through my coaching through the great mentors I've, I've had, through what I've seen in life, you know. So probably main thing is transferring that that sort of 58 years of life and putting an old head on young shoulders, I guess. You know, that's probably what I'm trying to do now is is taking all that experience and helping as many people, people as I possibly can, you know, through Performance by Design, through the Nurture Group um, retreats that are obviously on hold at the moment, through the Ruse Men's Wellness and Leadership Club, which, again, is probably something we haven't been able to do for a while. But, yeah, just taking that experience and, and hopefully imparting as much of that knowledge as I can on as many people as I possibly can. And that's probably my goal for, for the next – I'm actually going to get to 100 because I want a letter from the Queen. So <laughs> I've got another 42 years to – to go, so I'm right you know. there with you, mate. I'm right there with you. My, <laughs> my great grandmother lived until she was 103, mate, and I'm going to outdo oh, her. Yeah, so yeah. look out. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Mate, that's probably my goals at the moment is to, yeah, to really be as involved as I possibly can and help as many people as I possibly can. Yeah, uh, awesome, mate. Um, jumping straight into the the ambush round, then, uh, which are just the quick questions that uh, the yep. listeners always want to glean your words of wisdom on. What's your favourite quote, and why? Probably, I read this cartoon once and it was a, a grandkid going up to his granddad and he said, Granddad, I don't really know what I want to be when I grow up. And granddad said, just be a good person. There's plenty of vacancies. <laughs> and, and I reckon that's as good a quote as I reckon I've ever heard, particularly in, in where we're at as a, as a nation and as a world at the moment. Yeah, it's, I haven't heard one of that before, mate, and um, I'm going to use that now. Uh, thanks, yeah, mate. It's a good one. Yeah, that is a good one. Mate, uh, on the literary front, uh, apart from your books, uh, and here it is, is a, a great read, what, what's a top book that you'd recommend uh, people have a read of and why? Um, I, I like The Way of the Peaceful Warrior by Dan Millman. It's a really good book. A mate of mine, Brett Stevens, recommended it to me about 20 years ago, and, yeah, I'd recommend that really highly to to anyone listening, The Way of the Peaceful Warrior by Dan Millman. Yeah, I haven't read it, mate, so that's going straight on the Kindle list uh, as soon as I get off the call here today. Yeah. Um, that's a ripper. Uh, just in terms of advice generally, what's the worst and the best piece of advice that you've ever received? I, I, I really remember this. Um, uh, Mickey Conlon, I don't know why it sticks with me so much. I was captain, I got named captain of the Fitzroy Footy Club in my first year. And um, I was, wasn't playing that well. And I remember we'd finished training and he said, mate, are you okay? I said, oh, look, I'm, you know, I'm a bit disappointed. I'm not playing that well. He, and he said to me, he, he said, look, I've played more bad games than I've played good games. And I didn't agree with him on that. But he said, I've never lost faith in my ability, you know. And, and he said to me, look, you're, you're a great player. Just always have confidence in what you can do. And I, I really remember that and it sort of resonated. I think we can get down on ourselves a lot. Yeah, and particularly at the moment, always have confidence in yourself and your strengths and, and understand what you're really good at and that really st- stood out for me. Um, what's the worst piece of advice? <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably, mate, you would have lived through it. I remember my accountant, it's probably in, in your field too, late 80s um, when the, the interest rates went from 13% to 18%. <laughs> I remember I got on this... this compound, uh, what would they call it? It was an interest where you'd actually never really pay anything back. So your loan would go from like, I bought this apartment. Uh, for line of credit, yep. Yeah, I bought this apartment for 120000 and everyone thought, yeah, property was going to go fantastically well. <laughs> and so I 
I got talked into making this loan. So by the time I sold the property, my loan was 180000 <laughs> and the property was worth 120000 because the interest rates went up. So that was probably the worst advice I ever got, I reckon. <laughs> That's a good one, mate. Um, now, uh, back to habits for a minute, just to close this out. Uh, what's a, a critical personal habit, and I, I like to refer to them as happy habits or rewarding rituals or daily disciplines that you believe have contributed most to your success? Um, the habit that contributed most, certainly recently, has been meditation, but I only started meditating uh, probably towards the end of my uh, playing career. So that's probably... At the moment, I meditate every morning, so that would be the current one. Um, I think for me, I was really lucky. When I say lucky, I actually trained a lot by myself, and I reckon that gave me the personal discipline to 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 do it, just do it, just do things. When the little man on the shoulder says, don't do it, I think when I was actually training by myself because I went overseas and lived in America in quite a few off-seasons, and I had to do it myself. And I think that just taught me when the little man says don't do it, um, you just got to do it, you know. So they're probably the, probably the two tips that have helped me the most. Yeah, it's, uh, again, that personal accountability coming yeah. into the equation, mate, which is it's such a, a rare exercise. It's it's who we are when people aren't watching. Yep. The, the, the true 100%. character comes out, doesn't it? Yeah, 100%. Mate, uh, final question then to wrap all this together. Uh, if I gave you a microphone that spoke to every single one of the 7.7 .7 billion people that are currently alive in the world and I gave you a minute to talk, what would you say? I, I think you've just touched on it then when, when you asked me before we came on. It, it really was personal accountability. Let, let's stop blaming everyone else. And the world has really become divide and conquer. Australia has become divide and conquer. I was in America for a long period of time, you know, with, with, um, with Donald Trump and whether you like him or not. I mean, his platform was divide and conquer. Yeah, yeah it's really easy for us to blame everyone else. Yeah, what I would like, to, what I would say to those 7.8 billion people is take firstly personal responsibility for what you can control. What, what, is, what is in your life that you can control? That would be the first thing. And secondly, be kind. Reach out to people. We, we, this, this has been disgraceful, the divide and conquer in Australian politics on, on COVID. You know, there's this notion that we're all in together couldn't be further from the truth. And it's been driven from, from politicians. We're not in this together. No. We have to come back. And we have to be kinder to each other. And we have to have more empathy for each other. Some of the things I've heard, you know, particularly people that are overseas, oh, they should have got on a plane. Hang on. Someone's working overseas or married to someone overseas. I mean, some of the stuff I'm hearing now. And yeah. so it would be take personal responsibility and show more kindness to each other. Yeah, very well said, mate. They're... Uh the things that we all all know, but uh, for whatever reason, we allow situations to get in in the road of that. And and you, you make a very good point. Uh, unfortunately, COVID has driven a lot of separation and isolation. And and, and again, unfortunately, the algorithms on on social media platforms uh, help reinforce that. Uh, yeah. being the reality. So I think we've certainly got some work to do around that, mate. But um, you've been very generous with your time today. Uh, I, I know that Performance by Design and the work that you're doing with Tammy and the rest of the family with the Nurture Group and, and uh, you know, the Men's Wellness and Leadership Club are making a real difference in the world, mate, and uh, really appreciate you coming on and sharing your words of wisdom today. No, oh, thanks, Bushy. No, it's a great conversation. Thanks very much and well done on what you're doing too, mate. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Talk soon. To get a summary of all this investment gold in the show notes, just email me on hello at khgroup.com.au. That's H-E-L-L-O at khgroup.com.au. Or check us out at www.bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. I look forward to joining you next week for another episode of the Get Invested podcast. So thanks for listening. And as always, dream as if you live forever and live as if you'll die 